Hello, good evening, great to see you. And as we gather for Worship 101 tonight, we are going to be looking at art, and not a guy's name, <laughs> artwork in uh, worship and in the life of a Christian. It might seem natural or obvious or something we take for granted, but actually in thinking about artwork and worship, it it isn't a given that um, you know, it's just automatic. Uh, some people uh, really don't want to uh, consider all that much artwork. It is almost something in many people's mind that is frivolous or secondary. But uh, in, in thinking about art in, in general, uh, I just want to start with uh, just a, a few thoughts on, on why we do that. So uh, up on the Facebook page, we have the study guide. Thanks, Dana, for putting that up. Hi, Christina. Good evening. And all who are watching, good evening. Uh, we're going to be talking about art tonight. So uh, that is a, a subject that is kind of near and dear to me. I, When I was in high school, I had two things that I really enjoyed when it came to school. Uh, one was biology and and. Uh, science in general, and another was artwork. And um, I guess I used both sides of my brain at that time anyways. And uh, I thought maybe we could um, put the two together and become a medical illustrator. And uh, I wonder how my life would have been different if I would have chose that, but I'm very thankful that I chose to be a pastor. Uh, but uh, ever since that time, I've, I've been very, very fond of art. Uh, I haven't uh, practiced it that much, to be honest, in terms of drawing or painting since I've become a pastor. I would, I would have to do that, as with uh, many things, it uh, uh, is something that you have to work at or, or you lose. I, uh, I spend much more time with music, actually, these days, and that is an art form in itself as well, and um, one that certainly has been incorporated into the worship life of the church in very many different ways, and we're thankful for all of those ways. So, as we talk about art, why, why do art, or is there something inherently wrong with having art in church? Uh, some people throughout history have thought so. So, good evening also, Karen and Lisa, uh, and all who are out there in the interwebs, as they say, and uh, so great to be with you tonight. Now, uh, as we uh, talk about artwork really quickly, I just want you to consider that uh, when God created us, he didn't create just the spiritual part of us but uh, he made the whole person the way they are in creation. Uh, God uh, fashioned our very bodies. He, he made us who we are completely. And of course, Jesus redeemed us completely, not just our soul, but body and soul. And on the last day in the resurrection, uh, we will be raised body and soul. And so the whole person... Uh, is is cared for and created by and redeemed by God. And also uh, in our day-to-day -day life, uh, Christ our Savior is, is Lord of us, which includes all of us. And so it is certainly only fitting that uh, we look at the whole being, including that artistic part of us, as a gift from God and, and something to be nurtured and put to proper use in worship and in the church and in life. Uh, so, so when God made us, what did he say? He said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, Genesis 1, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. I think it was Francis Bacon maybe said that uh, as, as he was 
considering it that uh, religion and faith are are those things where God works in us a partial restoration of of our our, our um, spiritual being after the fall into sin, and in science and the arts, uh, God also uh, is working to restore the the new person in Jesus Christ. Uh, so uh, you know, not everything he said we would certainly agree with, but I think that. Uh, Looking at that quote, uh, there, there is some merit to it. Uh, remember, God created us in his image, including the image of the God who made us by fashioning us out of the dust of the ground. Um, now, some people looking at the commandments, uh, you know, the uh, first commandment, you shall have no other gods. In, in the Reformed Church, they number the commandments differently, so what's forbidden is making any idols. Uh, so, uh, Exodus 20, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. So, some have taken that to mean that artwork is verboten. You can't do it. Uh, it's, a, it's a big no-no, people would say, and... Uh, still in the Reformed Church, there is that thought. Uh, some churches are very, very bare bones because uh, they don't think that we should do that kind of artwork. So um, you may have seen that that anti-artwork bias, and that was there at the time of the Reformation too, right? Uh, you know, uh, people got on board with Luther very, very... Uh, quickly uh, when you look at it and uh, uh, you know it, it got to be a problem when they started smashing all the artwork trying to get rid of it uh, and uh, so Luther reacted against that at the time of the Reformation of, of carrying things too far and getting rid of all of the artwork and there is uh, a, a good biblical basis for that in the Old Testament when we look at art uh, for example, um, we see that uh, in uh, the tabernacle of the Old Testament, art was a big part of it. Uh, so in Exodus 25, it says, The Lord <clears throat> said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel that they take from me a contribution. Uh, from every man, I, and, and this is amazing how it's put, from every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution for me. And this is the contribution that you shall receive from them. Gold, silver, uh, bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twisted linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skins, goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the lamb, spices for the anointing oil and for fragrant incense, onyx stones and stones for setting, for the ephod and for the breastpiece and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst Exactly as I show you, uh, God says, concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all of its furniture, so shall you make it. Uh, so God was interested in the tabernacle being a work of art. For example, um, on the Ark of the Covenant, Exodus 25, 18, and you shall make two cherubim of gold of hammered work shall you make them on the two ends of the mercy seat. So these golden cherubim uh, were, you know, people had to figure out, well, how do I hammer out these figures of these angelic beings out of this hunk of gold? And uh, it took working out and, and figuring out to, to do that. Uh, and that is, in essence, uh, uh, what art is all about. So looking at the, the whole council of Scripture and uh, seeing this pattern in the Old Testament, God isn't saying that we should rid ourselves of all artwork, of any visual representations of anything. What God is saying is that we shall not worship that. We shall not make idols out of it. And, of course, as we look at that first commandment, uh, idolatry extends beyond just uh, fashioned figures that we might worship as they did in antiquity. It can include anything, certainly. 
uh, our cars, our, our standard of living, our lifestyle, our, our favorite things, yeah, even a favorite show on TV or movie that we become obsessed with or something like that. Uh, anything can take the place of God if we give it first place in our lives. And uh, that should always be avoided, even in the art world, of course. It, but uh, uh, so as we look at what scripture is saying, it's not forbidding, forbidding artwork, it's forbidding idolatry. Uh, as if to, to emphasize that, um, just, just think about the, the lampstand. You might be able to say, well, the, the mercy seat, that would have a special religious purpose. Well, what about the lampstand? It, it, it's for light. But that lampstand in the tabernacle is to be made out of pure gold, of hammered work. Its base is stem, its cups, and this is from Exodus 25. Its calyxes and its flowers shall be of one piece with it, and there shall be six branches going out of his side, three branches of the lampstand out of one side of it, and three branches of the lampstand out of the other side of it, three cups made like almond blossoms. You know, why do that? What theological statement is this? It, it is, uh, you know, perhaps you could discern some theological meaning to it there, but uh, also a big part of it is just for beauty, for decoration, for artwork. If there's anything that should be adorned with artwork here, God designed the tabernacle in the Old Testament so to be. So again, on, on, the, on the priestly garments, the, the ephod, uh, um, this is what it says in Exodus 28, uh, on its hem you shall uh, make pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet yarns around its hem with bells of gold between them. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a pomegranate. It might be purple or scarlet. Pomegranates are red, but definitely not blue. Uh, so here we have even uh, an abstract, uh, in, at least in terms of color, uh, form of art. So artwork need not be photographic in nature. And indeed, looking at photography, it's not just simply replicating a scene, but it is expressing that scene or person or whatever you're photographing artistically. So you, you look at it artistically as you uh, even uh, go about photography, which is perhaps... Uh, in terms of artwork now, uh, my one of my major expressions of it. But uh, uh, here you can see it even in the priestly garment. And so if you look at Exodus 37, you see this guy Bezalel. And he made the Ark of Acacia wood, uh, followed God's design for it. Uh, he, you know, intricately crafted it. He made the cherubim. Uh, and um, it describes that in Exodus 37, 1 through 8. So we do have definite biblical precedent uh, very early on, in fact, uh, for artwork. And so maybe we can just get that out of the way with some, some idea that there is something bad about artwork that, that somehow, you know, in our puritanical roots in the United States, we've, we've gotten this idea that, that art is just secular or, or just maybe even not Christian, but, but there is a proper and a Christian use of art and, and a long history of it at that. So if you look at the study guide, uh, we'll, we'll follow that more closely tonight. And um, I'll show you some things off of the study guide. Uh, that that we can look at, and the first thing is what are what are some symbols of the church? And actually, uh, I don't know if you happen to have one of these at home. If you have Luther's Small Catechism with explanation, uh, there uh, is um, both in the newer and the older versions. Uh, there there are our Christian symbols with their meanings. It's kind of interesting. Around Christmas time, if, if you think of Christmas, you know what those are. They're basically Christian symbols decorated, made out of styrofoam that you hang on Christmas trees. So uh, many Christmas have many of these these diagrams with them. And I'll try to <laughs> show them to you here real quickly. So there you, and, and you can perhaps even read this on screen, but 
Uh, the one on top there is the alpha and the omega, and those are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. And uh, that brings to mind the words of Revelation 1.8, when Jesus uh, said, I am the alpha and the omega, who is and who was and who is to come, the almighty. Then underneath that, you can see the anchor. Uh, and uh, like an anchor keeps a ship safely in position, our hope in Jesus Christ keeps us as believers safe and secure. Then you see uh, a picture of a baptismal font. And on our study guide, that baptismal font uh, uh, also is, is spoken of too. And so if you know our baptismal font at church, uh, it is a three-sided uh, baptismal font. And uh, so that th those three sides, uh, not surprisingly, uh, bring to mind the Trinitarian uh, statement uh, that is spoken at baptism when we place God's name upon the person being baptized and say, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So our three-sided uh, baptismal font brings that to mind there are many eight-sided baptismal fonts that are represented, uh, representative of, of Noah and his family and how God saved them through the waters of the flood. In the Lutheran service book, Baptismal Service, uh, there is a section that talks at a greater length about that through, through the sacrament of baptism, the Holy Spirit gives us God's gift of faith, forgiveness, and salvation. Uh, and these gifts are, are often uh, displayed very prominently uh, in um, uh, the artwork of baptismal fonts. Uh, perhaps, as you can see on ours, with a shell and three drops of water also. And we'll talk more about that. Um, uh, so some more symbols that uh, we might happen to have here, if you can uh, see those displayed at all. Let me get that. Where can you see it? Uh, there you go. Uh, and it has a picture of the Bible. Through God's word, the Holy Spirit works faith, uh, and through faith, eternal life. We see uh, also a, a picture of the butterfly there, and uh, the butterfly uh, is something we we definitely use at uh, baptisms, and uh, as the caterpillar emerges uh, from a cocoon as a beautiful and changed creature, this also is a symbol for the resurrection of the dead. It, I think it's really cool that in, in Marshfield, uh, thanks to uh, Melissa and others that uh, have the um, monarch and now a swallowtail uh, display at Wildwood Zoo, that that's a good reminder of that. So uh, a, a huge shout out to all that are involved with that uh, amazing project. Uh, and we get to see that here in Marshfield. Uh, so as we look at some more symbols, uh, you can see them here on the page. If I hold it steady, uh, the candles or, or the flame shows us that that Jesus is the light of the world. I heard a good story about votive candles today. Maybe I'll tell you that one sometime. Uh, the circle reminds us that God is eternal without beginning or end. The three uh, intertwined circles that you can see there uh, show us uh, that uh, once again, we have a triune God, one God and three persons. Uh, also, another symbol, which you can see here, looks like a P and an X. It, that is the key row. It's made up of the first two letters of the Greek word Christ, which means uh, the anointed one, the chosen one, the Messiah. Uh, you can also see the, uh, uh, the, the um, clover there with the three leaves. And uh, this reminds us of the tri triune God as well. You can see a picture of the crown and cross, uh, which is a reminder that 
Uh, Jesus has won the victory for us and given us the victory over uh, death and and the grave. Uh, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of eternal life is the promise in uh, Revelation. Uh, We see that there's a a picture here at the bottom of this page, if I can do it backwards, yeah, uh, which shows the uh, chalice and and the bread. So in the Lord's Supper, we receive the bread and the wine, and um, that is also depicted in artwork. Uh, we receive in with and under the bread and the wine the very body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of sins, new life, and eternal salvation. Uh, up here, we see the, the, the all, all-seeing eye, if you will, uh, reminding us that God knows and sees all things. Uh, now we get to the symbols for some of the different Gospels. Uh, and here, uh, if I can possibly show you it. Uh, Matthew is represented by a winged man, uh, for his gospel begins with the list of the ancestors of Jesus. Uh, Mark is shown as a winged lion. Uh, Mark's gospel begins by describing the voice of one crying in the wilderness, um, like a lion, uh, uh, there in the wilderness. And, um, uh, also, uh, Luke is symbolized by a winged ox, uh, and this uh, is because the Gospel of Luke shows in most detail the sacrificial suffering and death of Jesus Christ. And uh, also, then when we get to the Gospel of John, that is represented by an eagle, and John's Gospel soars with Christ's love and power. All of those are... uh, really come to us from the book of Revelation as well. Uh, The lampstand there we can see also as a reminder of the sevenfold gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, The Holy Spirit gives us his gift through the means of grace, God's word, and sacraments. So those are are some Christian symbols. We could uh, talk about a great many more, but if you have um, a catechism, uh, that is a good place to find some of them. Other symbols that I'll just kind of describe, uh, if you see uh, the words I or letters I and R I on the cross, that refers to uh, the inscription Pilate put on the cross, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Uh, the fish is an interesting symbol as well. Ichthys is the Greek word. It kind of looks like a I X is funny O with a line through it, a Y and a, a weird looking Z, but it's ichthys, and uh, it is um, uh, each of those letters stands for the first letter in each of these words in in Greek: Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. So that's the meaning of fish, and um, this was a very early Christian symbol course, um, going back to uh, the feeding of the 5,000 and how that was depicted uh, with, the, with the fish that was involved with that. Uh, uh, I, and uh, you can uh, picture early Christians. One may have drawn the top circle uh, or you know part of a circle, curve, I guess. Another may have drawn the bottom part of it, and together they would have made a fish and uh, also just identified each other as Christians at the same time. And uh, so that is, uh, you know, some symbols that we still have to this day uh, of, of Christianity that have come down to us through the ages, different, different symbols with their different meanings. Uh, so some of those you can uh, add to your repertoire of Uh, Christian symbols. Uh, So we talked about uh, some of the symbols. Uh, Why why spend money on buildings and art? I I think that this goes back to what I was talking about before, where, you know, it it shows how valuable it is to us, uh, how important our faith is to us, and uh, to to adorn um, the place where we worship with art, uh, just as a reminder of 
of um, the God of beauty uh, and how beautiful it is uh, when we have people who bring us the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, why not express that also in our artwork? It's, it's part of who we are, part of the way God made us, an expression, an outpouring of our, our faith uh, that, that we do this. As far as, as some, some history of, of um, church design and art, of course, uh, we, we could, you know, kind of working our way back, talk about uh, cathedrals and uh, how even uh, they were shaped in, in the shape of a cross with a transept, as it's called. Uh, our church was initially designed to be more of that shape than, than it currently is. Uh, which is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, but uh, church architecture is, um, you know, striking. Uh, even to steeples with crosses on top. I, I can tell you when I, when, I, um, when I go running sometimes in, in strange places and, and, and covering the miles, I, uh, it, it really is welcoming to see... Uh, rising up from the horizon, uh, a steeple with a cross on top of it, and you know you're getting near a town, and uh, it draws your gaze upward, and uh, it, uh, you know, in, in architecture language, if you will, it reminds us to uh, keep our minds uh, centered and, and focused on, on that which is noble, that which is honorable and, and and praiseworthy and true as as we're reminded to do in holy scripture and uh, certainly uh, directs our attention to the cross even uh, reminiscent of when when Moses uh, put the bronze serpent up on a pole that the children of Israel would be uh, spared from uh, the the um, venom of the snake, that, that their lives would be rescued. And that was even a foreshadowing of the crucifixion, a foreshadowing in art <laughs> of the crucifixion of Jesus, uh, where he died for the sins of the whole world, that we could be uh, saved through him, and that all who look to him are saved. And so this is expressed even, even in um, the, the artwork of architecture. And uh, so... Um, one one thing that you know studying art history is is not an easy thing because um, when it comes to artwork uh, it's almost like the written word right how do you interpret what is being said when you look at a piece of art uh, I may have a different idea about that than someone next to me in a in a art gallery looking at the same picture at the same time. And the, the one interesting thing about art is that it, the artist may have a description of, of it. And um, so uh, as, as he or she describes their meaning in that artwork, uh, you know, you, you learn the original intent. But the amazing thing about art is that even the original intent of the art doesn't always fully express the meaning of that artwork to the viewer at the time. Uh, so, so bearing that in mind, the history of artwork, trying to interpret it, is, is, is a difficult study to, to get right. Uh, I have... Uh, uh, a really good book, but is it's not an easy book. Understanding early Christian art here, uh, I, I do recommend it. Uh, some things you do have to take with with a grain of salt, like like many books. You know, you you don't uh, just automatically say, yeah, that's right, that's right, without you know thinking about it in a way that you know is that really true. For example, uh, you know it. There are a lot of opinions about art, and, and you have you have to kind of weigh those opinions against each other. That being said, it's it's a very very good good book, and um, so the the author Robert Margaret Jensen describes um, 
you know, some of the features of early artwork. And um, one thing about early Christian artwork is that it was limited. Uh, there, especially in the first few centuries, there wasn't a lot of Christian art that that we can access anymore anyways. Um, you know, and, th and that's another thing is like a lot of art just didn't survive. We, we don't have it. We, there's a lot we don't know about art. Uh, so, but in looking at, at Christian art, uh, that there are some limits on, on early Christian art to, to consider. One is that, um, you know, there is a, a time before which we really don't have any extant Christian art. So we, we can't, you know, definitively identify art as Christian art any earlier than the end of the second or the beginning of the third century, for example. Another thing is that there was a, a limited uh, assortment of themes and motifs in early Christian art. So you had um, early Christian art that borrowed from the pagan religious world uh, and and um, used some of the just ways of expressing yourself artistically, but adapted them to the Christian's teaching. Then there were religiously neutral images, uh, you know, decorative motifs that they adopted and used them for Christian purposes. Uh, then there were uh, images that were drawn from, <laughs> literally drawn from, uh, some of their favorite biblical stories. And lastly, there were portraits of Christ and the saints, and typically that last group uh, came later on in time. Um, some of the favorite stories that they had were, and images that they had were images of the, the Good Shepherd, of Jonah, of Abraham, Isaac, and Noah, uh, of Daniel, and of the baptism of Jesus. These were some of the things that were emphasized in Christian artwork you know, in the earliest centuries, uh, before uh, many other artwork as well. A lot of these come into us from the catacombs, uh, the underground burial chambers. Uh, and so the one that you can see there uh, under above my hand is, uh, uh, if you look at it here, it's hard to get the right hand, uh, but that is a picture of the Good Shepherd. And uh, here on this side is a picture of, of uh, Jonah being thrown into the water. And um, so those catacomb drawings were, were some of the earliest uh, uh, Christian artwork that uh, we, we know about. Um, if you think about it, those underground burial chambers would be good ways to preserve artwork. Perhaps that is one reason why we have so many of those uh, another reason uh, is uh, pre-Constantine, of course, <laughs> Christianity itself was underground because it wasn't the official religion, and uh, uh, they underwent um, several different periods of persecution as well. Uh, so um, certainly they didn't have like public church buildings like we do now, where you can go in and say, oh, that's a public church, look at the walls, that's art, that's Christian art. You know, we don't have that. Uh, what we have are, are these uh, drawings on, on the walls uh, in caves and catacombs in the early Christian church. And um, so so that is, is where our knowledge uh, about uh, artwork comes from. Um, there, there are just a few uh, famous uh, artworks, pieces of art that we have. Uh, one interesting thing uh, that, that we do have is, is that the picture that I put up on the uh, announcement of this, uh, that, that, that is a famous picture uh, from fairly early on in, in Christianity. Um, also, uh, when it comes to the very earliest of Christian artwork, it, uh, the, the kind of the technique and style in the, in the early centuries was, was simple, almost humble in their presentation of their subjects and uh, sketchy, <laughs> not, 
not in the negative sense, but you know, it, were, it was sketches uh, and uh, simply rendered without a great deal of ornate uh, decorative elaboration uh, that was used. Uh, so th this was some of the earliest of Christian artwork um, and things changed as the centuries went along. Um, and uh, just want to point out that uh, artwork in the history of the Christian church is not separate from um, the written art. Uh, the same kind of things that they wrote about, they also had in their artwork. It's not as if these were two opposite ends of a spectrum in the, in the early church. And so you had, you know, the church at large, not, you know, going beyond just maybe the organized church, but you had people, uh, a community, and, and this is both the community out of which the artwork um, came and also the community that it spoke to. So it was very much a part of life together in the, the early church. And I think that's kind of important to understand about, you know, the early centuries of, of Christian art. So um, we talked a lot about that. Uh, I'm going to, in our um, study guide, kind of talk about, you know, we, we discussed the baptismal font a little bit already, uh, discussed the altar, um, beautiful altar that we have in church, by the way, but uh, it has something in, that is similar to many other altars. There are, are five crosses uh, that are, in, our, in, the, in the case of our altar, that are carved into the top, one on each corner and one in the middle. And any ideas why we have that, why there are five crosses? Uh, perhaps you can guess if you think of uh, the candle that we have uh, for Easter, uh, and how we talked about that, maybe there's a clue there. Uh, but uh, any re any ideas why there might be five crosses on the altar? Let's see if anyone can come up with that. Uh, while you're thinking about that, I am going to uh, go on and, and talk about, um, you know, as we look at the pulpit, that's beautiful too. We have pyramids on the pulpit. Uh, the pulpit... Uh, in its raw form, uh, certainly is not only practical, but also an artistic expression of, of holding sacred preaching in the Word of God. Um, so we have pyramids. Pyramids are just the cloth artwork that we have in church. So I'll um, show you some of those things right now, and we'll uh, work our way into, into uh, some, you know, some further discussion so here on one of my stoles, which is the pyramids that the pastors wear, uh, you can see that it has the cross, again, reminding us of the sacrifice of Jesus. Um, even perhaps we could see, see uh, that the, the circle there reminding us of it's a, an eternal sacrifice uh, or, or that God gave his life on the cross. There's a lot of different ways you could interpret it. Uh, even uh, that the cross is... Uh, something that uh, is where a, a holy sacrifice took place as Jesus gave his life for us. And uh, what you see is, um, you know, bearing in mind that this is a red uh, stole, a red pyramid, it, it's used in Pentecost, so you have flames. But yet the way that they're depicted there is reminiscent also of, of the drops of blood that flowed uh, from uh, Jesus wounds on the cross. And so you have um, in the juxtaposition <laughs> of the cross and the flames for Pentecost, uh, the way that they're depicted, um, it tells a story. And that is uh, also a characteristic of, of the earliest of Christian artwork, uh, it, is that they took a lot of those familiar uh, artistic elements that were just Part of everyday life and it just so happens that uh, by and large uh, a lot of the artwork from those early centuries are, are from the area of Rome and so they used uh, you know typical Roman artistic motifs 
but the way that they put things together, it told the story of Christianity. Uh, so also here, if we look at another stole, uh, we can we can see this one during Lent. Uh, you have a cross uh, with uh, the, the white garment there. Uh, so in the Lutheran Church, uh, th this is significant, um, a significant reminder of how Jesus was uh, taken down from the cross and and buried and um, uh, you know it, it's a reminder also of how uh, they they took Jesus's clothes and and, and uh, gambled for them at the foot of the cross you know a kind of a reminder of that as well but the fact that the cross is empty that Jesus isn't hanging on it reminds us that Jesus isn't dead he rose from the dead he's alive hallelujah right and so the the empty cross in in, in the Lutheran Church uh, it is a powerful uh, symbol uh, in itself. And also here we see that uh, the, the lamb, uh, Christ as the victim, the sacrificial lamb who was sacrificed for the sin of the world is depicted there in, in the artwork. And uh, these elements, you know, with uh, the cross, the kind of, I guess you could call it the halo, uh, and, and even by its head, that, that red cross, uh, you can see um, the palm branch underneath it. So all of these, you know, when you put these symbols together, it, it tells a story. And um, it, it came to be in the church that uh, many of these symbols being put together in a certain way kind of became customary or um, kind of, a, you know, a language in itself. And th this was highly developed in, in what are called icons. And I, I have one here that was that was given to me, if you can see that, uh, and a picture of, of Jesus. Uh, just very uh, stylistic elements of it that had to be drawn a certain way. And, and um, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, monks, etc., were trained to uh, be able to produce these icons. And they almost view them in, in, in what we might term a sacramental uh, way uh, as a kind of a way of when you look at them and, and contemplate on their meaning that is kind of almost a window into heaven if you will uh, and um, there are, are different um, <laughs> iconic icons I guess you could say uh, that um, you know were used throughout the centuries and uh, so here you have in the Bible this passage from the High Priestly Prayer, the glory you gave me I have given to them that they may be one just as we are one. And so uh, all of uh, these different elements, even the way that Jesus is depicted holding his hand, the color uh, of the clothes he was wearing, all has uh, meaning to it that you could memorize and learn and uh, be part of your life of worship uh, in a very different way than we're used to, but uh, was it and still is a, a, a historic part of the Eastern Orthodox Church. So um, that is uh, something that, uh, you know, just looking at uh, history, uh, you can see there, um, want to point out in particular uh, this uh, stole. You can see the, the wheat on it. Um, so that, that can have a lot of meaning. Oh, and, and in the back there's, there's that cross. And um, this, this is not just a decoration in back, but for the pastor to consider as he puts on his uh, stole uh, that uh, that he considered the cross of Jesus Christ and, and his calling to proclaim uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, so, but, but that, that wheat, I'm going to talk about that just in the context of the history of Christian art. And uh, so um, uh, I'm going to talk about that briefly if I can find where I have that here. So, 
So in Christian art, um, in the Roman Empire, as I said, as we have, uh, you know, the, this emerging Christian art that was being used, one of the one of the frequent symbols uh, was uh, the the grapevine or or the stalk of wheat, and um, uh, I don't know how well you can see this. But there is a, a kind of a, a base relief of um, a harvest scene with good shepherds and harvesting the grapes. Uh, this is from a fourth century sarcophagus. Uh, and uh, much of that early Christian artwork, as I said, was uh, having to do with, with um, graves, with burial. Uh, with, both in the catacombs and also in the sarcophagus, that, that ornate carved artistic um, coffin cover. And so um, I'm going to talk about that, just that theme of, um, of, of the vine and the wheat. Uh, so uh, here's, here's what, the, again, the author of, of this book, Early Christian Art, says. Nearly countless other symbols appear in Christian art, including a variety of birds, I kind of like that uh, because I, I enjoy uh, nature photography, in particular birds, well, in particular uh, warblers, but that's another story. Uh, here, uh, early Christians focused on peacocks and doves, actually. Animals, including deer and dolphins and plants and trees, including palms and laurels. Uh, among these symbols, however, she says, two in particular also appear as metaphors in the Gospels and have significant parallels in theological writings, grape vines and bunches of wheat. Grape vines arguably are one of the most popular decorative motifs in Roman art and as such are also common in early Christian contexts. We also find these themes quite naturally associated with Dionysian themes in Roman art, uh, etc., as well as uh, uh, iconographic traditions that may have directly influenced Christian imagery. In addition to these associations, however, harvesting motifs often served as allegories for the seasons, spring and autumn, along with the figures of small children picking olives or carrying flower garlands. So that, that was just a common Roman thing, right? But in Christian art, great vines loaded with bunches of ripe fruit are common, also often being harvested by children. Wheat is slightly less popular, but often appears in Christian art harvested along with grapes. Bunches of wheat also appear in images of Adam and Eve, indicating the consequences of disobedience, backbreaking labor in the fields in order to produce food to eat. So uh, wheat and grapes served many purposes, had a lot of different symbolic meanings, uh, sometimes very different um, symbolic meanings. So uh, she goes on to say, Christians no doubt appreciated the decorative qualities of these motifs and took them over from pagan art, but in time must have added new significance to the symbols. Jesus, after all, speaks of himself as the true vine and the bread of life. At the Last Supper, Jesus spoke of the wine as the fruit of the vine and the loaf as his body promising to renew the banquet in the kingdom of heaven. Connecting the Christological symbol from John 15 with wine at the Last Supper, the text of the Didache, which is um, a, one of the very earliest Christian writings, speaks of the cup of wine as the holy vine of David. Clement of Alexandria also saw the grape as both a Christological and a Eucharistic allegory, a grape, you know, because of its color bruised for us in order to produce blood that when mingled with water brings salvation. So looking at uh, the grape as a reminder of the sufferings of Jesus and then how that also becomes wine, uh, again brings to mind the sacrament of the altar. Subsequent commentators on the symbolism of the vine also saw it as a Eucharistic metaphor. The alternation of wheat, grapes, and pomegranates over the font in the baptistry of Dura Europos might have been intended to refer to the Eucharist following baptism. In addition to the sacramental signification, however, according to Jesus' allegory, the vine is Christ and its branches represent the apostles and by extension the church. 
This symbolism is also used by early Christian writers. Irenaeus cites Hosea 9.10 in which God finds Israel as, a, as new young grapes, imperfect but full of promise for a plentiful vintage. Um, she goes on to say, as all these texts, and so she cites other church fathers, make clear the symbolism of the vine as the church is complete only in light of the harvest. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says that those branches that do not produce fruit will be gathered up and thrown into the fire. This threat is echoed in other Gospel texts, such as the parable of the wheat and the weeds, in which the coming of the kingdom is compared to the gathering of the wheat and the burning of the weeds. Because the motifs themselves show the harvest, we cannot overlook the significance of these texts. Probably more than simple references to the Eucharist or to the church and its many branches, these harvesting scenes may serve as pictorial references to the eschatological, that is the end time, harvest, perhaps partially realized among those already dead. Given the fact that we see only fruitful vines and ripe bundles of wheat, the viewer is reassured that the deceased have been safely gathered in. So, uh, I'll no pun intended, but a whole host of uh, symbolism can be drawn from how the early church took over just these common decorative elements in Roman art, such as um, bunches of grapes and 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 wheat, uh, and it, it shows us uh, Christ Himself. It shows us the sacrament uh, of Holy Communion. It shows us um, the church is pictured. Uh, the harvest, both of um, drawing people into the church uh, and also the harvest on, at the, the last day, at the time of the resurrection. All of this can be depicted. Uh, so, and, and we happen to have that all, that whole history and all of that meaning, including the scriptural uh, images, all present here in, in the wheat that are, are uh placed on the, the pastor's green stole here at Christ Lutheran. So very interesting to just look at all of the history about that. Uh, Christina, good, good question. Uh, wasn't artwork also used to talk about Holy Scripture because most people at the time were, were illiterate? Uh, it came to be used that way, especially in the Middle Ages, uh, but uh, you know, in, in speaking about this period in the earliest centuries of the Christian church, it uh, was not just to be a storybook, but it was an honest artistic expression. It, it didn't replace writing. It was side by side with the writing of, of the early church. Uh, but that, it, that is a good, a good question. During the time of the Middle Ages, certainly, uh, especially when, for example, Latin came to be used. Uh, it uh, was not uh, very common for people to know what was being said, so they, they learned a lot about the faith from, by that time, the, the very highly developed artwork that came to be used in, in the church. Um, and uh, some of the very, some of the biblical scenes that that were commonly depicted in stained glass windows and mosaics and and other things. So I I've been talking a lot, but I, I do want to move on to uh, some uh, uh, goodies that I have for you. I guess you could say uh, talking about some of the beautiful art that we have at, at Christ Lutheran. Uh, we have our our stained glass. Windows and here, as you look at that, this is the top uh, center of our stained glass windows uh, behind the altar of our church. Um, we have a depiction of, of God with the, that circle that we talked about, and um, certainly also reminiscent of the sun. And you can also see the cross depicted there if you look carefully. I believe uh, you can see. Uh, flowing from God, uh, uh, the, the Holy Spirit, if you will, uh, as well depicted. Um, you can see God's power displayed. Uh, just a few other highlights. Uh, here you can see uh, on top some of those bunches of grapes that we are talking about, as well as the circle of the wafer, the, the bread there depicted, also with a cross uh, motif on it. Uh, 
closer picture of the, the grape and also a uh, depiction of the wheat uh, above it. Uh, here also, if you look at the stained glass window, and maybe when you come to church, you can pick some of these things out. You can see that we have the, the shell used for baptism, the water droplets that fall from that. Uh, also a, depic a depiction of um, Holy Scripture uh, as, as a book uh, here. And uh, here for the Old Testament as a scroll. If you look carefully, maybe you can make that out. And uh, also, uh, in our stained glass windows, it, it flows right into showing how God's word goes out into the world. And you, see, you can see the globe here. And a village, actually. I don't know if you ever noticed that, but there's a village where, again, the word of God reaches every corner of the world and all of the villages. And you can even see the, the people all gathered about praising God. Uh, rejoicing, you know, it's a festive uh, scene that we have. And um, so, so here we have uh, a reminder of the time of the Reformation. Artwork was a big thing. This is the Gotha altar. Uh, um, and uh, we have some Reformation era imagery on 14 hinged wings and a stationary center panel. Uh, 157 panels altogether with scenes from creation and scenes from the life of Christ. Uh, and uh, so that is uh, a remarkable piece of artwork in itself in looking at that. And um, it uh, probably wasn't actually used in church. It was in... in uh, in a home, kind of, kind of a princely home, uh, in fact, and you know some of the nobility would have had this uh, pictorial depiction of different scenes from the life of, of Christ, and um, here's up close showing one of them, uh, uh, you know, and uh, perhaps the transfiguration there. I'm guessing. I, I had to have to look closer to see what the, the text is uh, for that. Uh, thanks to Dana, she uh, got me some of these pictures from her book of Reformation, things from when she saw the museum display, and that was here, I think, in the Twin Cities. So that is um, uh, something pretty awesome uh, to, to think about, and certainly when we uh, did our tours in Germany for the in, in 2017 as we celebrate the anniversary of the Reformation got to see an awful lot of artwork and uh, the the full description of the stained glass in church you can see in uh, the study guide Dana put a picture of that there she also put the answer uh, five crosses are the five wounds of Jesus uh, his two hands two feet and his side and uh, so uh, still today, uh, the, the, the artwork of, um, of um, uh, the, the church, you know, even though many people know how to read, that there, that there is something added to that by Christian artwork that, that enhances, if you will, um, the, the written word and, and depicts it in, in such a way that it adds meaning to it. So uh, just in case you don't have a study guide handy, um, I'll go through that real quick. The architect of our church, Lawrence Monberg, uh, this is what he says. Not only members of Christ Lutheran, but people in the community have watched with interest the building of Christ Lutheran Church since the start of construction in late summer of 1968. I was one, uh, well, yeah, I was, little over one year old, I think, at that time. Uh, and now see it completed and dedicated on this second day of November, 1969. Christ Lutheran chose for his new facilities a site in the southwest section of the city where it could erect his new building in a spacious setting and also allow for generous parking facilities for his members and visitors. So the space around the church is part of the artwork. Very interesting. 
to provide both an easy entrance and exit. The church building has two main entrances, both leading to a large oak-paneled narthex, which can be used for many purposes, but especially for Christian fellowship between and after the services, a vital element in church life today, by the way, that is something that has only been uh, added to in, in modern church architecture, that the narthex has grown in size and functionality and uh, in the way that it's done. Uh, so uh, to the left and right of each entrance, rooms are provided for the Sunday school and other meetings. You know, that's that transept, the, you know, kind of the idea of it being in the shape of a cross, right? Uh, one of these will be used as a lounge area. Things have changed since then, of course. Going from the wood and glass enclosed narthex, we enter the lofty nave of the church, which immediately envelops the worshiper in reverence and sanctity. Architecturally, the church was conceived using simple geometric forms that lend themselves to contemporary construction techniques. Laminated wood arched from the principal structural elements which rise in ascending order from a low point at the narthex to the soaring height of the chancel area. So, uh, you know, going into the church, it's like your, your world is being expanded as you contemplate the, the, the you know, the, the, the um, not only, you know, the, the doctrinal uh, content of scripture, but just how God goes far beyond any mere human limitations, right? Uh, and, and, and your life is, is made new in ways that you never would have imagined. So your world is expanded in worship, and um, that's depicted architecturally. Uh, the importance of the sanctuary and chancel is the principal architectural element, and emphasis is given in all scales. Horizontally is the base of the arches increase in width, vertically as the, as the arches ascend, and in volume as a combination of the two theologically. It is the sinner coming to the presence of his Lord and Redeemer and joining in praise of him who loved us. Uh, so he goes on there and talks more about uh, the, the structure uh, then the windows, so he talks about the windows in the chancel area of the church. These were designed by Professor Richard Kemmerer, uh, who uh, w was part of a famous family uh, at that time, and still is a famous family, but they were active at that time. He was an artist at Valparaiso University. The windows were fabricated under the direction of, the pro of Professor Kemmerer by the Conway Universal Studios of Glass in Winona, Minnesota. The artist's own description of the windows follows. In designing and fabricating these windows, I thought of the people at worship and a motif appropriate to the design of the building. What I have done is simply an illustration of the doxology in our Lutheran hymnal, Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. So everything flowing from that central image of the circle, the a golden circle with a cross above, and it just flows from that. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly hosts, with the angels depicted. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, with the Trinity depicted. This is one of the six great hymns of the church. We have across the top the symbol of the Trinity, he says. On the right side, we have a book with open pages, and on the left side, we have a scroll from the Old Testament. Uh, beneath that, on both sides, we have all creatures here below. On the left side, we have the sun and rain growing trees, houses, in fact, even factories with smoke coming out. Uh, obviously, very, very abstract. On the right side, we have the crescent moon and stars. So you have night and day, sunshine and rain, the whole world in a geodesic glow. Beneath it, representative of all people on earth are the colors of men, black, red, yellow, white, and brown. In fact, there's a little pagoda shape on the right side and beneath that of family, people, father, months, mother, son, and daughter. In other words, the window is the faith life of the Christian church on earth and one overarching act of praise, etc. In fact, uh, you have also represented in those stained glass windows on the side, which is interesting when our addition was put on, uh, because that was covered up and the sun couldn't shine in. We had uh, lights put in. If you go down the hallway by the pastor's offices, you can see panels on the side there. They open up and that's where the lights are that provide light for the windows on that side. So um, you can see the story that they tell. It is a picture of, you could say, the seasons of the year, 
Uh, or I like to think of it as the seasons of life, you know, bright, vibrant colors in, in one corner. And as you go around, you know, the colors start to fade and, and become gray. So it's a reminder that the church is for us from, from cradle to grave. And, and for me, this goes back to, um, you know, the, the days when I was a vicar. And I, I remember very vividly at the, the beginning of each school year, uh, the pastor, Pastor Zender, would preach a sermon from cradle to grave. And that very thought is, is um, uh, depicted in our stained glass windows that go around the side of the church as well. It's a sermon every time you walk into the church provided by art. So that is a little bit about art. I went a little bit over uh, my apologies, but hopefully it was good because uh, I, I, you know, I just touched the surface of all of the artwork. Well, I didn't literally touch. Never, never mind. But anyways, uh, uh, it, it's good to think about that and all of the ways that God has made us, which he made us this way so that we could praise him, right? even in the form, or perhaps especially in the form of artwork. And um, so uh, that brings us to the end. Uh, let's have our final prayer. We pray, Heavenly Father, we thank you for how you have so wondrously and fearfully made us as, as we are to be able to express ourselves, not only in the written word, but also through, through other forms of art, uh, even artwork that we did not describe uh, we could think of the the kind of art also where it, of liturgical dance or, or of our puppet ministry at Christ Lutheran Church and all of the ways that that they express themselves through both the puppet ministry and the dowel rods you know that's all artistic and all ways that you have given us to praise you we thank you for this we pray that we would continue each day every day night and day to praise you with all we are and have and, and all the, the, the beauty and wonder that you've put inside of us, that that would, would redound in praise as, as we worship you, as, as we, we pour out uh, the, these expressions of, of, of thankfulness and praise. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so God's peace, blessings to you. I pray you all have a, a wonderful and and. A beautiful evening. We will see you soon. Take care. God bless.